Hi, I'm Derek Mills. Welcome to the Globe Podcast. In this special edition of the Globe Podcast, I'm excited to bring you a series of lectures about the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali from Professor Christopher Chapel. Dr. Chapel is Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology and founding director of the Master of Arts in Yoga Studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. He's published over 20 books about Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, yoga, and religion and ecology. And he's also a featured teacher on GLOW. In these episodes, Professor Chapel will chant the Sanskrit for the sutras, explore their themes, and talk about how they apply in life. He'll give you the sutra's philosophical context and relate them to movement practices in yoga. In the very first lecture, Dr. Chapel points out that this is a rigorous course of study. You are, as he says, meant to be challenged, but the rewards can be great, so stick with it. Here's the first series of lectures assembled for you in podcast form. Welcome to GLOW. My name is Chris Chapel, officially Dr. Christopher Key Chapel. I am the Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, where I also founded and direct the nation's only Master of Arts in Yoga Studies. I've been in yoga for a very long time, and in this quick introduction, I'll explain how that happened, and I'll also explain what will happen as you enter into this course. First, yoga. I found it as a teenager. I found a teacher from India. I lived within an ashram community for 12 years while I was completing my undergraduate and, un and graduate degrees, MA and PhD. And during the course of that dual academic training and ashram spiritual training, we founded at Yoga Anand Ashram in Amityville, New York, a study group that met every Wednesday night over the course of roughly seven years. And during those Wednesday evenings, we read acutely, minutely, these short verses these expressions, these epigrams that encapsulate yoga philosophy. We read them in the Sanskrit. We consulted the Sanskrit commentary written by Vyasa. We read all of the different translations. There were only about a dozen available back in the 1970s. And as we discussed, as we analyzed the grammar, we came forth with the publication that appeared in India in 1990 that was later revised and updated and augmented with this book that was published in 2008. And some years later, we did a third version called Sacred Thread that is a photo illustrated presentation of the Yoga Sutra. And what we're going to do over the course of these 20 hours is to lift up each sutra. We're going to share the translation, the translation that was rendered through these long evenings of conversation and discussion, through consulting the various commentaries, and very importantly, checking in with our own experiences with yoga under the tutelage of Garani Anjali. And we will, after the translation, chant, and I'll repeat it three times, chant the Sanskrit for a cluster of yoga sutras, explore the thematic topics chapter after chapter after chapter, there's four of them all together of the Yoga Sutra. We'll look at some of the lifestyle implications. We'll of course open with a frame narrative about the overarching philosophy and ethics and the meditation and the movement practices of yoga. And then 
because many of you are yoga teachers or may someday become a yoga teacher, will offer through this course some suggestions about how that particular yoga sutra might find application in your life and in the lives of your students. Warning, this is not an easy course. This is not a friendly, user-friendly version. This is rigorous. This is going straight from the Sanskrit from more than 1,500 years ago. And this is really at the level of a postgraduate seminar in Sanskrit language, in philosophy, a little bit in history, broadly in the psychology and spirituality of yoga, and you are meant to be challenged. Please hang in there, work with us, and explore, play, learn, embody all that can be found within the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. The Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, also known as the Patanjala Yoga Sutrani. This text, this larger tradition known as the Yoga Shastra, arrived into modern consciousness over a long period of development. Development within India, the philosophical ideas of practical experimentations with different forms of meditation. And to give an idea of the emplacement within history of this text, we have to go all the way back to the Vedas, to the Rig Veda in specific, in order to find the first usage of the word yoga. Sanskrit language stands with us today as the oldest surviving Ur language or primal language of the Indo-European family group. And the narrative goes something like this, that in those cradles of civilization, we know about Egypt, we know about the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, but a little bit to the north and perhaps a little bit to the east, maybe around the Caspian Sea, maybe a little bit to the east, lived a group of people who were very successful, who spoke a language that became the root language, this Indo-European language, the root language for hundreds and hundreds of languages that we now speak throughout the world today. Some of these people migrated to the West, and the language that they brought evolved. It turned into the Germanic languages, it turned into the Romance languages, Romance languages including French and Spanish and Portuguese, the Germanic languages including Danish and English and German. Then the languages of Central Europe up into Russia, and then as we go east, Persian language, part of the Indo-European family, Old Persian, very, very, very close, the language of the Zendavesta to the language of the Rig Veda. And then by around 1500 BC, maybe a bit earlier, we find the composition of these amazing poem songs that give honor to fire that give honor to the Indo-European hero god known in India as Indra, known in Greece 
as Hercules, known in Scandinavia as Thor. And these hymns include stories about charioteers and these Indo-European people throughout that continuum grew up in a reciprocity both with dogs as well as horses. Dogs as companions and horses as steeds to be mounted, to be harnessed, to be harnessed into the chariot. And this became the central metaphor for the later practice of yoga. Now, because Sanskrit and English are cousin languages, there are many, many words that carry over, including the word yoga itself. It carries over in English to the word yoke. And just as oxen are yoked to a cart, so also horses through the reins are yoked to the chariot. And to be able to rein in on the horses, this control, this power over, becomes the very first expression of yoga itself, that yoga entails the reining in, the control over the five horses, the five horses also known as the five senses. So from a very early period, we get this as a metaphor for yoga, for yoking, and yoga from this verb root called yuj. Also, in addition to yoking, means to contemplate, to be able to, in a sense, go inward. Yuj, yujir, contemplate, yuj, yukta, yoga, to yoke. Now, this literature of the Vedas gives birth to interpretations because the Vedas were written so long ago and they were celebrating a lifestyle that had changed that commentaries called the Upanishads came to be written about those Vedas. The oldest of them, the Burhadaranyaka Upanishad and the Chandogya Upanishad, lift up and celebrate the energies of the body, lift up and celebrate the breath, lift up and celebrate this notion of self-discovery. And then the later Upanishads, such as the Sveteshvatar Upanishad, the Kata Upanishad, the Maitri Upanishad, these Upanishads, perhaps as recent as maybe 300 BC, 400 BC, we don't really know for sure. But these Upanishads begin to describe yoga as spiritual practice. They begin to talk about this notion of yoking with the soul. They begin to talk about the regulation of breath and building upon the narratives about the senses and the body and the breath found in the earlier Upanishads, we begin to see a gathering together of a worldview that introduces also the notion of freedom. The Buddha, who lived around 500 BC, lived in a community that valued ethical practice and meditation. And in fact, we often associate the Avedas and the Upanishads and the work of those early Brahmins with northwestern India. And to the northeast, where lived the Shramanas, the early Jain communities, and much later, the Buddhist communities. These people, rather than relying on Vedic literature and the Upanishads, 
rather than relying upon a priestly caste who had memorized and handed down sort of codified ritual and specific behaviors. To the Northeast, in the area of Varanasi and northward and eastward toward Calcutta today, we find a different vision of human possibility emerging, grounded on meditation and honoring this notion of freedom from, freedom from social restriction, freedom from family, freedom from the psychological burdens that plague human yearning. And those Buddhist and Jain ideas, known as the shramanical family of ideas, had a little bit of influence as those Upanishads were being written, as these people began to mingle with one another, and so many different stories emerged, stories from the Himalayas, stories from Kutch in the westernmost part of India, and so many local deities under worship, so many different gods and goddesses got intertwined, vocabulary including their names and their qualities became part of this treasure trove of literature. And these were people who traveled extensively. These were people who all of them were polyglot. All of them would know multiple languages. Even today, to be born in India means that you're born generally into a minimum of three languages with which you become fluent, and often five, six, seven languages. So out of this highly intellectual, highly experimental milieu, this middle place, somewhere came an individual known by the name Patanjali. Now, there's a myth about him told in the Puranas. And this myth, this legend, identifies this human being as having descended from the heavens. And according to this narrative, some of you perhaps have seen the image of Lord Vishnu who eventually comes and takes 10 different incarnations throughout the course of human history. Lord Vishnu, before making his descent as avatar, reclining upon a rather magnificent snake. Okay, this is a theme depicted frequently in classical Indian art and in popular Indian art. Well, the story is that one day, that snake got really bored with being a couch. And while Krishna-to-be, that is, Lord Vishnu, was asleep, he managed to prop up the body of Vishnu, the body that contains the entire universe, and he snuck away. And he came down out of that heavenly realm with this amazingly supple body. I've actually been part of a dance drama depicting this with amazing dancers from India. And this body, snake, swirling, twirling body came down upon the earth and you'll see statues of Patanjali. There's only a few, but you'll see at the base of his body is the coiled kundalini image of the serpent. Then arising from a magnificent torso, a very alert countenance of someone very intelligent, someone simultaneously deeply compassionate. And while on the earth, that snake human was able to slither here, was able to slither there, was able to slither to the north, to the south, to the east and the west. And as is the long-standing tradition in Asia, went to learn a little bit here, blending in, went to learn a little bit here, blending in, and gathered 
from those Brahmins who know the Upanishads, gathered at the Jain monasteries how to practice, how to conceptualize, how to describe karma, how to behave in the most nonviolent fashion, went over here and learned from the Buddhists, learned about their way of doing the Brahma Vihara, learned about their staging of different styles and forms and levels of meditation, and learned not only from the traditional Theravada schools, from the Vishuddhi Magga taught around that early period, but also learn from the Mahayana schools about the stages, ultimately the Dharma Mega stage of Samadhi. And this mythic, legendary, sort of shape-shifting philosopher digested all of this material. And based historically on the vocabulary to be found, to be explored, we know that he could have composed this no earlier than about 200 CE. And from some of the vocabulary, probably a bit later than that, maybe 300 something or even perhaps some say 400 something. But he came up with these beautiful nuggets. Ata yoga nushasanam. Yoga chitta vritti narodaha. You'll hear them all. But in these, we find embedded a worldview, and we find transmitted his distillation of what is possible for the human, his distillation of all of the obstacles to be overcome, and his measured reflection, truly a unique contribution, of the limbs of yoga that can be traversed in order to enhance human goodness, human potential, human freedom. And he was very careful, even though, according to the story that I just told, he was the foundation for the Vaishnavas, he was very careful not to reveal his place of origin. In fact, there's other stories about Patanjali that would have him affiliated with any one of those other places that we've mentioned, any one of those monasteries. The Shaivites, the followers of Shiva, no problem with yoga. The Vaishnavites, no problem. The Jains, no problem, they love Patanjali. The Buddhists, we in fact have a sixth century record of Buddhists who then followed Patanjali's Eightfold Structure in describing their particular way of doing Buddhism. So what he did was develop a text with universal appeal, a text that at its core is secular, that aligns itself with no particular religion, a text that arises out of multiplicity and embraces and celebrates multiplicity, all within the confines of 196 short statements. Now in the ashram, we memorized and we would chant out en masse all the verses of the second pada, all the verses of the sadhana, the practice instructions. And as we chanted this, we could hear echoes of themes that swirl, that circulate, that spiral into a place of, oh, this is it. And then he would take it from another angle. Then he would spiral it. He would work it. And we would hear echoes of some of the same vocabulary, echoes of some of the same form. And this intimacy with text led us to curiosity about the grammar of the text, led us to examine every single verb root, 
led us to examine why people would make certain translation choices. And in bringing to the world this translation, what we were able to do was to find a word that will work, a singular English equivalent for a Sanskrit word that so many times would be layered with meaning such that different translators would use different words. And what I learned from Tibetans, I trained in translation methodology, both from a Sanskrit perspective and from a Tibetan perspective, but the Tibetans who translated all of their Mahayana Buddhist work from the Sanskrit had a rule. And that rule is find a word, stick by it, if it doesn't work, use the original. If it doesn't work, invent a new word. So as you will hear and receive this translation, you'll see, you'll gather some fluency and a handful of Sanskrit words, and it'll be explained why they don't really translate. And you'll find a consistency in a word such as arta, a very important word that means purpose that defines why we do what we do in service of experience and in service and moving ourselves toward freedom. So this is an enduring text, a text that kept the attention of the Jain community well into the 18th century, the great scholar Yashuvijaya. Before that, the Jain scholar Hemachandra, 11th, 12th century, loved the Yoga Sutra, structured his own Jain interpretation of yoga even before that. In the sixth century, the eighth century, two scholars named Haribhadra using the vocabulary of yoga, even in the eighth century, using that eightfold frame of Ashtanga Yoga to describe this practice and this enduring interest revived at the end of the 19th century as the theosophists and others reclaimed and reintroduced yoga philosophy to the world. It's at the core of the movement called modern yoga. And by studying this, you are challenging yourself to learn this in a textual way, to learn this in a philosophical way, in a psychological way, to embody this in a spiritual way. Good luck, namaste. The first three sutras of the first pada, the samadhi pada, first in translation and then in Sanskrit recitation form. Now, teachings on yoga. Yoga is the restraint of the fluctuations of the mind. Then the seer stands in its own form. Ata yoga nushasanam. Ata yoga nushasanam. Ata yoga nushasanam. Yoga chitta vritti narodaha. Yoga chitta vritti narodaha. Yoga chitta vritti narodaha. Tada drashtahu svarupe vastanam. Tada drashtahu svarupe vastanaham. Tada drashtahu svarupe vastanam. These three remarkable sutras are like a portal. They allow us to enter into the experience of yoga. The very first word that is uttered, atta, 
brings us to the present, brings us to the here and now, calls us to attend, to show up, and to listen to these teachings on yoga, an anushasanam is a related word to the word shastra. And a shastra is a work of philosophical reflection, a work of instruction. An anushasanam refers in a broad sense to all of the insight and all of the possibilities that can be learned from within the yoga experience, from the yoga traditions. And then this remarkable way of defining yoga that draws from an early insight of the Buddha, that draws from the vast literature that describes the outflow and the fluttering and the fluctuations of the world, and draws from the abiding interest in Indian thought in this thing called consciousness and all that becomes attached to consciousness. So yogesh chitta vritti Narodaha. Narodaha is the stilling. Narodaha is the restraint. Narodaha etymologically refers to the blowing out of that kindled flame that causes all of the engagements with attachment, all of the engagements with woe, all of the engagements with the difficulties that are inherent in life. And all of these are ripples. All of these are vrittis or turnings. Literally, the root word here, vritt, means to turn. And if we think of sometimes when we settle down at night, where we look at a dog settling down to take a nap, we turn around and we turn around and we go from one side to the other side until we're able to go into a place of quiet. And all of that is in relationship and stoked by the chitta. And the chitta is the derivative of consciousness, the outflow that connects us with the world and in moments of yoga, we're able to bring all of that rambling and roiling into a place of equipoise. One of the great images that one might employ in thinking about this or even trying to teach this is when we've been in a pond or even jumped into a swimming pool and we see the placid, calm, still of the water. And then either the pebble goes into the pond or our bodies jump into that empty pool and then the waves start. And the waves lap up against the side of the pool or they emanate out to the shore of the pond and that rambling and roiling comes to define how we engage the world, how we self-identify, how we relate with other people. That experience of chitta vritti is held in common by each and every individual. Every individual emplaces herself or himself in the world through these ripples, through these moments of touch, through these various forms of connection that generate from that quiet place of chit. And in yoga, the project as defined here is to be able to understand 
the ripple effect of our presence and at appropriate moments to be able to place that on pause, to be able to go back into a moment of Naroda, to be able to go back into a moment of quiet. Tada, drashtahu, svarupe vastanam. Tada, then, and I'd like to think, tada, okay, then what we get is the emergence of the drashtu. And in the translation that was shared, we made a gender neutral decision because it's neither masculine nor feminine. This place referred to as the seer. Drush, drushdu, dursh refers to the ability to look on, the ability to go into a moment of dispassionate gaze, a moment in that stillness where rather than identifying with all of those ripples, the ripples have stilled and the pond simply stands in its elegant, present goodness and beauty. And that place is our birthright. That place is our svarupa, is our wonderful, quiet place that gives us an elegance that cannot be spoken, that gives us a confidence that bears no trace of arrogance, that svarupa, that trueness of our own form gives us a sense of stability, of astanam, sta, a gift of the Sanskrit grammarians to the world, that sta, cousin word with the English word stand, suggests that we can take a stand. We can take a stand in that moment of connection. And we must, in fact, take a stand. As a sage once said, you have to stand for something or you will fall for anything. What a gift to be able to understand the ramblings and roilings of the fluctuations that emanate from this connection with consciousness. What a blessing to be able to, through yoga, and this is actually the definition of yoga, to bring all of that activity, to bring all of that remarkable, quite sometimes beautiful and quite other times distressing connection with the world to be able to bring it into a place of quiet connection. Svarupa, Avastana. And recover this remarkable capacity of the human being to be simply a witness, a seer, a drashter. Philosophically, this signals the chitta and the drashter in juxtaposition to one another. This is code for two words that appear later in various guises throughout the text. Code words for prakriti, which is the forward creation, as one scholar says, the procreation of all of the things of the world, the prakriti, 
all of the fluctuations manifesting and reflecting back and solidifying one sense of self in relationship to others, prakriti, chittavritti, and then drashtu, the ownership of purusha, the emplacement in that moment of the silent witness, emplacement in that surety that it's okay to simply look on, to go into that place of sublime and sacred regard, that place of being the spectator, that place of being unmoved, not in a callous way, but in a way that brings comfort to that sense of transparent self and brings comfort to others that feel and experience through your ability to give witness, to be able to model that calm for others. We will see various words throughout the sutra that discuss the wonderful, magnificent gift that we receive and that we give to others when we can find that place of the witness during moments of nirodha, during moments of pulling back on the reins of the horse. Now, as yoga teachers, this becomes your central and primary metaphor for teaching and explaining to yourself and to others the yoga experience. So let's visualize moving into a yoga asana studio. It may look a bit like this with perhaps cleanness, perhaps a wood floor, where people show up and they present themselves, they roll out their mat, and they find themselves with body, with breath, invite it to breathe and invite it to move. By becoming purposeful about body and breath, one experiences that moment of chitta vritti. And as yoga teacher, your job is to bring people into that center point, bring those yoga students, or if you're the yoga student, samastiti, to bring yourself into that place of standing, and then become mindful in the sense of chitta, of all of the outflows, all of the vrittis that are embedded and contained within pranayama instruction, within asana instruction. And during the course of moving upward, moving sideways, moving forward, moving backward, all of those are more than mere metaphor for life. All of those are life itself. And as people are brought to awareness of how the breath can unlock holding within the body, how sifting through all of the chitavrittis of pride, of shame, of comparison, that as one feels the limits of one's born body and explores the possibility of freeing some of those limitations and detecting the emotional connection with even the, the fascia that defines posture, the fascia that defines extension, the posture that 
speaks to us and makes us feel that, that's where we begin to see that edge. That's where we begin to really go into a place of recognition of the fluctuations, the repetitive fluctuations that bring either bondage or freedom. And that moment of yoga that can culminate within Shavasana, that can lead toward having gone forward and backward and to the side and to the breath, perhaps a little perspiration, perhaps a sense of a forward stretch, of a backward stretch, that all of that in the choreography of a well-delivered and a well-experienced yoga class can culminate in Shavasana. And that moment of Shavasana entails a movement into a sense of the witness a movement into becoming the drashtar, becoming the seer, and allowing all that had accrued, all that one had brought into that yoga class, to evolve into a place of evaporation, to allow that difficulty, that cloak of karma, which we will explore in further classes to dissolve. In that moment in Shavasana, when you're lying simply as if a corpse, that is a moment of release. That is a moment of Naroda. That is a moment where the stillness takes precedence. The stillness becomes central, the stillness and the quiet, those last moments of a yoga asana class, those become the gateway into a direct sacred experience of the teachings of yoga, anushasanam, and the effect of yoga, citta, vridhi, Narodaha, Drashtu, the witness, sees the quieting, becomes, even for a moment, the witness. And in that, the peace of yoga becomes manifest. The experience of yoga becomes real. And this experience is what you can prepare yourself for, you can prepare others for, won't always happen. But when it does happen, this is what brings people back again and again to the practice of yoga, this experience of deep serenity. At other times, the seer seems to take the form of the fluctuations. Five fluctuations exist, afflicted and non-afflicted. These are correct cognition, error, imagination, sleep, and memory. Correct cognition arises from perception, inference, and truthful testimony. Error or false knowledge has no foundation in form. Imagination is the result of words and knowledge that are empty of matter. The sleep fluctuation depends on an intention of non-becoming. Memory recalls previously experienced conditions. This cluster of sutras 
which we will now chant in Sanskrit, delineate the content of citta vritti. Vritti sarupyam itta retra. Vritti sarupyam itta retra. Vritti sarupyam itta retra. At other times, the seer seems to take the form of those fluctuations. Now the five fluctuations. Vrittayaha, panchatayaha, klishta, aklishtaha. Vrittayaha, panchatayaha, klishta, aklishtaha. Vrittayaha, panchatayaha, klishta, aklishtaha. Vritti. Panchata, five, either klishta, afflicted, or aklishta, unafflicted. Pramana, vipar, yaya, vikalpa, nidra, smritayaha. Pramana, vipar, yaya, vikalpa, nidra, smritayaha. Pramana, vipar, yaya, Vikalpa Nidra Smritayaha. The five, Pramana, correct cognition, Viparyaya, error, Vikalpa, imagination, Nidra, sleep, Smritaya, Smriti, memory. And now for a definition of correct cognition. Pratyakshanumana gamaha pramanani. Pratyakshanumana agamaha pramanani. Pratyakshanumana agamaha pramanani. Okay, pratyaksha, what appears directly in front of the eyes. Anumana, the way we figure out using our reasoning. And third, listening to someone who can give truthful testimony. Always of correct cognition. No error. Viparyayo mitya jnanam atad rupa pratishtam. Viparyayo mitya jnanam atad rupa pratishtam. Viparyayo mitya jnanam atad rupa pratishtam. Okay, error is false knowledge with no foundation in the realm of form. Now imagination. Shabda jnana nupati vastu shunyo vikalpaha. Shabda jnana nupati vastu shunyo vikalpaha. Shabda jnana nupati vastu shunyo vikalpaha. Vikalpa, imagination, is devoid of matter when it comes to words and knowledge. The next, the definition of sleep. Abhava pratyaya lambana vritti nidra. Abhava pratyaya lambana vritti nidra. Abhava pratyaya lambana vritti nidra. Nidra, sleep, depends upon alambana, an intention, a pratyaya, of abhava, the non-becoming, 
vritti of the vritti. In the Sanskrit sutra that defines memory. Anubhuta vishaya asam pramoshaha smriti. Anubhuta vishaya asam pramoshaha smriti. Anubhuta vishaya asam pramoshaha smriti. Memory, smriti, recalls some pramoshaha previously experienced conditions, vishayas. Now this cascade of sutras gives us an orientation point for understanding how our vrittis, how our engagements with the world find various forms of expression. And in the first instance, which is pratyaksha, we see what is to be seen. We smell what is present in the wafting of aromas. We taste, whether it be cardamom or chili, we taste with an immediacy and an accuracy. We touch and we feel, oh, is it cold out? Is it hot out? Is it humid? Is it dry? An immediacy of experience. And we hear, we hear the words as they're intended and we understand with clarity. We hear that there's a freeway in the distance. We hear the calling of a mockingbird, all of these are direct moments of pratyaksha, of perception of what truly is. The second moment to be discerned is viparyaya, is when we fall into error. And these errors can be errors of perception, thinking confusing that I'm hearing a freeway, but it's actually the ocean, thinking confusing, I'm tasting fennel, but it's actually licorice, confusing, misunderstanding a word that has been spoken, the source of many an argument, misunderstanding, how to interpret an emotional situation and perhaps opting for the less beneficial approach. All of those are ways in which we can get into trouble. Some of them honest mistakes, some coming from a long history of what in yoga is called samskara that predisposes our perceptions to be just a little bit off kilter, causes us to go into a place of error that causes perhaps some trouble for ourselves or others. The third category of vritti is samkalpa, is imagination, is our beautiful and wonderful capacity to constellate something that isn't there, but to imagine a unicorn, to be able to imagine or feature a life that could be a wonderful life. And there's also the possibility with imagination, depending upon whether it's afflicted or non-afflicted, a non-afflicted imagination will lead us to wonderful states of glorious presence and imagination afflicted with the burden of samskara and karma will return us again and again into a place of suffering. So what we need to do is to be aware of our capacity to conjure, aware of our capacity to conjecture, to be able to imagine, and then through yogic, attentiveness to work 
toward a place of purification. And then the fourth is coming to understand Nidrat, coming to understand this place, this in-between place of Nidra. On the one hand, for some people, sleep is automatic. Such was not the case in my own experience, and my own mother had to come and teach me, when I was a very small child, about six or seven, about a skill of progressive relaxation. And just as you might enter into a yoga nidra class today, so also I was taught by my mother to relax my feet and let them just disappear. Relax my shins and let them become soft. Relax my knees, my thighs, my pelvis, my stomach. Relax my fingers. Quite often, some people will go to bed clenching and to be able to will them into a place of abhava, will them into a place of release can be a gateway to the blessed restorative power of sleep. To relax the forearms, the elbows, the upper arms, Relax the heart, the breath, the shoulders. Relax any clutching in the throat or clenching in the face. All of that, a skill to be able to release, a skill to be able to cross over into that threshold of the life-giving, calm, experience, the restorative experience of sleep, parallel in many cases to a meditative experience. And then the fifth, the fifth great fluctuation is the fluctuation of memory. And again, recall that Patanjali said, it can either be klishta, afflicted, or aklishta, unafflicted. And we are burdened, layered with so many memories, some shallow and some deep, so many memories that can bring us to a place of happiness. And we will see further sutras, later sutras, that suggest specific unafflicted memories that must be attended to. But it's also important, rather than just pushing away the afflicted memories, the fraught, the difficult, the dark, if you will, memories, that these two can be brought into conscious awareness and then seen as merely a vritti, merely a fluctuation, merely a reinforcement of an experience that may have lingering after effects of stress or difficulty, but that by bringing it into awareness and then understanding its source of origin and accepting that it is no more, that that can be yet another gateway into that blessed, quiet state of calm, a recovery of the seer, the drashtu, a recovery of the witness, the purusha, through sifting out and sorting out and letting go that particular riti. Mark Twain once said, all of the worst things in my life actually never happened. And this is encouragement to understand our imaginative powers, to understand that sometimes the memories that we hold of something are a little bit more difficult than the experience of that thing when it originally arose. And this mix of understanding the five rittis becomes a way, as a yoga teacher, 
to be able to begin to bring a sense of stability, of grounding, of mooring. Again, the metaphor of the pond, you're in a rowboat, and then you see that you're reaching the other shore and you throw out that lifeline and allow that boat to be moored at the dock and allow the rippling to settle down and come again to that place of stillness. So as a yoga teacher, you can affirm, yes, you're experiencing in this yoga class a little bit of a respite from the worries of the world. This is a place you've directly perceived, a place of safety, and you, in your own practice, can find a way to return. Pratyaksha. That you as a yoga teacher can acknowledge that yes, students make mistakes. Could be in life, could be in following instructions for inhale and exhale, could be a yoga posture that requires just a little bit of an adjustment, but it's very easy to move from viparyaya, from a place of error, into a place of quiet correction. That as a yoga teacher, you can acknowledge flights of fancy, acknowledge that the imagination can take us to rather remarkable places, and in guided meditations, you can invite people to use those capacities of imagination as a gateway into a state of calm. And you can also counsel your students in a very general way that, yeah, sometimes you need to dial it in. Sometimes you need to move out of a delusion state an imagination that has brought you to a place that is perhaps not that helpful, but to be able to recognize and to name the power of imagination and bring it a little bit under control as a charioteer brings a horse under control. Pull back on the reins just a little bit. And then the fifth Fourth and fifth, sleep. We talked about Shavasana, that ability to just simply float on the mat like it's a magic carpet, to go through a progressive relaxation that for many, I know it's the case for myself, is that I'll go into these blissful sleep states in Shavasana and to affirm that as a moment of profound, not just relaxation, but of a truly profound calm, a state of momentary release. And then again, to engage memory, perhaps sparingly, in your own journaling and in the journaling that you encourage for your students to bring about a rhythm of first, going through memory points into a daily yoga practice that builds stability, but also to engage the memory to move always toward that place of elevation, always toward that place of abiding calm. Restraint, Naroda, arises from practice and freedom from desire. Practice requires effort and stability there. Practice becomes firmly grounded when carefully attended to for a long period of time without interruption. Freedom from desire arises in one without thirst for conditions seen or heard and results in a mindset of self-mastery. Abhyasa and Vairagya. 
Abhyasa Vairagya Abhyam Tan Narodaha Abhyasa Vairagya Abhyam Tan Narodaha Abhyasa Vairagya Abhyam Tan Narodaha Tatra Stitao Yatno Vyasaha Tatra stitao yat no bhyasaha. Tatra stitao yat no bhyasaha. Sa tu dirga kala nairantarya sakara sevito dirdha bhu mehe. Sa tu Dirga Kala Nairantaya Sakara Sevito Durdha Bhumehe Satu Dirga Kala Nairantaya Sakara Sevito Durdha Bhumehe Dursta Anushravaka Vishaya Vitrishnasya Vashikara Samjnya Vairagyam Dursta Anushravaka Vishaya Vitrishnasya Vashikara Samjnya Vairagyam Dursta Anushravaka Vishaya Vitrishnasya Vashikara Samjnya Vairagyam. These four verses begin Patanjali's direct instruction on what is needed to attain that blessed state of Naroda, to be able to move into that place and space of calm. It begins with abhyasa. And I love this word, abhyasa. It means practice. And etymologically, it is from the Sanskrit word us, which is the same word where we arrive at the word asana. But rather than asana in the sense of flowing out into the beautiful physicality mentioned later in the Yoga Sutra and mentioned with great detail in the later medieval Hatha Yoga literature, abhyasa is prefixed rather than suffixed. And this prefix of abhi, abhyasa, means that you exist intensively within the present. It means that you return intensively again and again to that state of being, of simple isness, of in the vritti, the fluctuation language above, being in a place of pratyaksha, seeing things as they are. But in order to rise to that state of full mindful awareness, of a chit, a consciousness state that is that state of calm, is that state of being able to witness without getting tangled up, that it's required that one do this, practice, whatever the practice may be, repeatedly, uninterruptedly, over a long period of time. And we'll return for details, but in the entry, to this section, we also must pay attention to the word vairagyam. And vairagyam is the ability to not fall into redness, okay, raga. 
remarkable Sanskrit word with cousin echoes and cousin terms in the English language. And raga also in English means rouge, means redness, means excitation. And the vi and the vi in this case means the ability to move away from that reddening, move away from the allure of all of the color, to move away and enter into a witnessing, a dispassionate mode where you're able to observe without jumping in. If we return to the metaphor of the lake, I think most people have had in their realm of experience a moment where they've been on a hike or even have driven down a road and then arrived at a beautiful pond and perhaps have seen swans gliding across the pond, barely emitting a ripple, and felt attracted to that vision, to that state, to that picture of calm, and felt that calm within the body, within the mind, with the quelling of emotions, and that metaphor, that real moment in the memories of many, is an experience of airagya, of letting things settle. Now, putting the two together, abhyasa. Okay? Abhyasa is a regular, consistent, commitment to honor that place of calm, to do it uninterruptedly over a long period of time. We know that to become an expert means that one has completed 10,000 hours of a particular task. Now, in my experience of yoga, I first discovered yoga when I was 15 years old. I earlier had learned a little bit of meditation, but throwing the asana in was something that was gifted to me in a book. And I said, oh, I think I'll try to imitate those postures. And some of them were easy, some of them were hard. I remember it was difficult even at the age of 15 to put out my legs straight in front of me. And then I went to a yoga class and experienced those places of constriction, experienced my shortcomings, both in terms of flexibility and strength. And I committed myself quietly, very humbly, to practice these movements day after day, morning after morning, night after night. And I can honestly state that from that tender age of 15, where I felt these constrictions and saw the benefit of asana to loosen those constrictions, that this practice was a way for me to crawl out of my self-imposed imaginings, but it was also direct perception of rather significant shortcomings. And then a couple of years later, when I was 17, I met a woman who instructed me about pranayama, and she had learned from her teacher this method called tribunda, and this became added on to my sitting practice, to my asana practice, and then adding on this pranayama practice. And now that several decades, if I go back to the time of meditation, it's been five decades, 
and a little bit less, a couple of years less for the asana, a couple of years less for the pranayama. But this has been my go-to every single morning. To begin with Tribunda, which automatically sets up a practice of a meditative awareness. And I'll talk a little bit more about Tribunda throughout these sessions, but Tribunda from the Hatha Yoga, the Garanda, all of the, the later Hatha Yoga classes talks about the inhale, lifting up from the earth, the holding, bringing down from the sky, the release of both, and then the steady hold of the exhale for a period of time. This is a beautiful practice, alluded to in the second pada. We will go into a little bit more detail on Tribunda. But again, the practice of breath counting and the practice of loosening and stretching and strengthening the limbs of the body and the core of the body, this is a practice that for me, brought slowly, steadily, a loosening and a stability, an ability to hold, stiti, a very, very important word embedded in this cascade of sutras that in fact, again, is related to that English word stand. You have to stand for something, you have to stand in something, or you're at the mercy of all of the other factors and influences from the past, from culture, that will knock you a little bit off kilter. And then this ability, which we will take up in the next 20 minutes as well, of discovering that beautiful gift of vairagya, that beautiful gift of regard, that beautiful gift, in the words of one teacher, of watching the parade go by. So often in life, we're at the whim of our own feelings, which often can be unexamined. We're at the whim of a culture trend or peer influence and we get swept up in this place of klesha karma, of the klishta aspect of karma, where rather than being fully present in the moment, rather than being able to observe and regard what is actually happening, we're subject to the ideas of others, we're subject to behaviors that we know from direct experience are not really helpful for the cultivation of our best self. And by being able to not thirst after vitrshna, again, a very Buddhist word, not thirst after things, objects, vishayas in the world, whatever that object may be, whether it be a cell phone, whether it be a particular type of candy, whether it's there for us to grab or to hear, okay, to be able to go into that place of repose, to be able to go into that moment of remove and just linger, and then deciding from a place of will, deciding from a place of better conscience, will I take this up? Will this object advance me toward that goal of returning to a place of calm? Or will that further stir up excitations that could be, in the long run, quite distracting? So as a yoga teacher, we have a responsibility. I think a little bit, as I just did, to share our story about how we fell in love with the benefits of yoga. Now, we don't have to go into a whole lot of detail, but we can model for our students, as yoga teachers, our commitment, our commitment to practice. 
and I've shared three aspects of my practice, but find within yourself what practice has worked for you so that when you share, you share from a place of authenticity. And you can be a little bit honest, a little bit sheepish. And I'm one of those rare individuals that has, in fact, cultivated a consistent daily practice that gets interrupted if I'm very ill or if my jet lag has placed me in some realm where my morning is my night, but still, I use the moment of wakefulness, whether in the middle of the night or in the middle of the morning or at the beginning of the morning, to practice, to do the breathing, to do the sitting, to do the asana, and to speak of those benefits sincerely to our students, to encourage them, remind them that abhyasa, is that place of sitting in intense presence and that the aspects of yoga that bring us to those moments of presence are to be cherished, are to be remembered, are to be re-embodied again and again and again even if for 50 years, as is my own case, life will be an occasion of joy with a sustained practice. And that is a gift that as yoga teachers, we can offer to others as a result of reflecting on our own experiences. And then as a yoga teacher, you can do it small or you can do it large. You can talk about vitrishna. You can talk about pulling away from the thirst and the yearning. Encourage your students to be aware of when an addictive behavior arises, whether it be the compulsive checking of a chirping phone, whether it be the compulsive consumption of chocolate, And one of the ways that we'll explore a little bit later is the application of tapas, the application of pulling away from a habit that may not even be anything wrong with it. For instance, dark chocolate. The studies funded by the chocolate industry have in fact stated that dark chocolate is really good for you. And of course, why do they publish those studies? Because they want you to buy your chocolate. But to be able to cultivate the will for a period, maybe a day or two, where you abstain from dark chocolate, if that's your affection, or whatever it may be, that can be a metaphor or an analogy For many of us, it actually is a lived reality of something that we'd like to do that gives us pleasure. But we also find that we're able to rise above and that we're able to say, oh, I don't don't need to do that. And that small lesson in Vairagya can be a wonderful assignment for your students, can be a wonderful assignment for them to write down in their journal How can I practice vairagya this week? What can I abstain from that will demonstrate that I have the willpower to prefer the state of samjnya, to prefer the state of knowledgeable unity with the most sublime that can never be grasped or held in a physical way, rather than finding solace in going again and again into the realm of riti, into the realm of a fluctuation that brings one down into a physicality that may be nothing wrong with it, but knowing that you have the power to do otherwise. This moment of enduring practice, this moment of being able to rise above, brings us yet again into a state of tranquility, into a state of calm.
the highest freedom from desire, no thirst for the qualities of nature, proceeds from the discernment of the seer, Purusha. Awareness arises from association with discursive thought, reflection, bliss, and a sense of self. The more subtle level has residues of karma only and is preceded by practice and the intention of cessation. Tat param purusha kyater gunavai tershnyam Tat param purusha kyater gunavai tershnyam Tat param purusha kyater gunavai tershnyam Vitarka vichara ananda asmita Anugamat samprajnya taha Vitarka vichara ananda asmita Anugamat samprajnya taha Vitarka vichara ananda asmita Anugamat samprajnya taha Varama pratyaya bhyasa purvaha samskara shesho nyaha Varama pratyaya bhyasa purvaha samskara shesho nyaha Varama pratyaya bhyasya purvaha samskara shesho nyaha These three sutras begin with a study of the gunas. And the idea here is that when that ability to practice vairagya reaches a certain level of acuity and excellence, then there is thirstlessness of rising above even the gunas themselves. Now, let me explain the gunas. Okay, according to Indian philosophy of the Sankhya school, taught in the Bhagavad Gita, as well as in another text called the Sankhyakarika, just as the realm of the vrittis can be organized in terms of five streams of fluctuation, so also, and the fluctuations become included in this, so also all of manifest reality expresses itself in varying degrees of Tamas, heaviness, rajas, agitated activity, and sattva, the sublime. So that, for instance, the human body can be viewed in terms of having a tamasic base, a rajasic energizing core, and a suffolk realm of sensory perception that connects us through thought to even our greatest potential. So sattva, rajas, and tamas. Every object, for instance, a cup of tea, depending upon the flavor of the tea, can be very sattvic, or it can be very, very energetic, or if it's a teacup of nettle tea, it could be like, oh, this is bitter, this is really, really hard to drink. And there could be even a tamasic aspect of a cup of tea. So the flavors of tea can be sattva, rajas, and tamas, or sattva, rajas, and tamas. And the teacup 
Okay, the teacup itself could be a work of beauty, could be a work that inspires a rising above to appreciation of being itself, or it could be an ill-crafted, very heavy, clunky sort of ceramic. This is, this is quite adequate. This is quite beautiful, two-toned, pleasant with its, um, its six sides. It's hexagonal, okay? So again, inspired perhaps by the Sri Yantra, by sacred geometry, okay? So moods, attitudes, people. Bhagavad Gita says, Regard people before you get involved. Are they going to bring you down? Are they going to keep you really busy? Are they going to edify your best nature? All of those ways of reconfiguring the world through the prism of the gunas gives you a frame by which or through which you can rise above unexamined yearning, rise above untrammeled desire. And when that begins to happen, there is a discernment, a kyati. Okay, the word sankhya means how to count things out. Kya, a cousin word of the English word count. And there's a, a counting, a reconnoitering, a, an engagement of the world, not through attachment through the gunas, but through the vision, in here for the first time, we find the seer, the drashter, named. Through the vision of Purusha, through the vision of that place of dispassionate calm, through that place of not getting pulled down. So this reciprocity, between the gunas, the realm of the fluctuations, the realm of activity, and purusha, the witness, the lightness, the sattvic mere presence, that place that we cultivate through our abhyasa, through our practice, through cherishing those moments of equanimity. And now, in the next two verses of this three-part cluster of sutras, we see practices that are conducive to meditation. And we begin to see the introduction of this notion of samprajñata, this notion that our ability to go to that place of samchnya, to go to that place of harmony, to go to that place of a higher knowing, a higher awareness, can be facilitated in the instance of this sutra in four distinct modalities. The first modality is the modality of vitarka. We'll be revisiting this word a little bit later with a little bit more detail. But in Vitarka, you purposely fix your mind on an object. It could be an object of memory, or it could be putting your place in the physical presence of a place of beauty that brings you calm. So earlier the metaphor was used, or the example was used, of a calm pond. And if you sit at the bank of a compound and you gaze out upon its banks, upon the trees that may frame the pond, as you regard the wildlife that may come in for an occasional visit or glide or float upon the surface of the pond, that that would be an example of Vitarka that you are purposefully using your concentration on physical objects in order to induce a calm within your own physical body. Then the next stage that's suggested here is vichara, of bringing about reflection, self-reflection, a reflection that 
allows you at a slightly more subtle level to experience an intimacy with those moments in past memory and those moments conditioned by samskara, another very important term introduced by Patanjali in this particular Yoga Sutra. The samskara, we can almost think of it as a samskara as being a scar. It rhymes a little bit. But samskara is when an action, a karma, occur, a creation that we engage or encounter, that that leaves a little bit of a, an imprint, a samskara, a, a, a memory point that on the one hand could be a beautiful memory point of that wonderful pond, or it could be a memory point from a moment of difficulty in the past, or even a, a, a moment that happens in the present that causes, for instance, an earthquake. If an earthquake were to happen, or if a tornado were to descend, that's an immediate samskara that we know will endure. Once you've experienced an earthquake, you will remember that earthquake. Once you've been in a hurricane, you will remember that hurricane. And in the skill of Purusha Kyati, you become one who can, rather than being re-traumatized by that memory, you can become a witness to those memories and allow them simply to be. Another place that one can cultivate through this is a place of ananda. And ananda is a place of bliss. And many yogis, many swamis, will see affixed to the name given to them by their guru will be this word ananda, satyananda, the bliss of truth, krishnananda, the bliss of Krishna, satchitananda, the bliss experienced in consciousness of the truth. In the experience of a yoga class, many students will in fact go to a place of bliss, even if it's for a split second. And that becomes a meditative state to be remembered. And through all of this, vitarka, vichara, ananda, there can be a transformation of a sense of self. And asmita, will arise that, oh, I'm a person who does yoga. I'm a person that has a go-to place that is not easily knocked off balance. Okay? And that identity, that yoga identity, becomes a little bit of a point of pride, but we have to be careful not to allow the pride to overcome but it can be a movement toward a confidence, a comfort, an ability to be within the body, to be within a flow of thoughts, to be in a network of relationships that are edifying, that build an edifice, a place that we would actually like to visit. And I think we've all had the experience of going either into the room of a teenager or going into the home of someone who has low regard for physical objects and not being necessarily inspired, but that we've also perhaps had a moment where we walk into either a home or a church or a well-constructed concert hall and we feel, oh, this reflects back to me who I truly can be in the most optimal of circumstances. And this brings us to a reflection on samskara and this notion that through abhyasa, through regular practice of going 
to that habitus, that place of the auspicious, that we can create a cascade of experiences, a cascade of samskaras that are salubrious, that are healthful, that are, in fact, auspicious, that bring us to a place of mangalam in Sanskrit, of mitzvah in Hebrew, of auspiciousness in English, that can become a built, intentional reality, a loka or a world, a world of yoga that through considered vitarka, returning again and again to that good place, through vichara, of through self-reflection, grappling with those subtle samskaras and moving them increasingly toward a place of purity, that we can find a place of bliss that builds a self of comfort, comfort to oneself and comfort for others. Now, as yoga teachers, we can create this moment in so many different ways. We can encourage our students to build through their journal a little bit of a commitment to put oneself in the company of beauty, to take that extra moment to organize our physical environment so that it can perhaps invite in fresh flowers, so that it perhaps can be part of our sadhana rhythm, of our yoga rhythm to make things tidy periodically, that students can be invited to go into, through the process of self-reflection, an exploration, sometimes a little bit unpleasant, of cataloging habits that bring a little bit of discomfort to oneself or annoy other people and make a little bit of a resolve to, through understanding those habits, to step away just a little bit, to be able to linger, say at the end of an asana routine, where people have worked through some of those difficult places in the fascia, where people are brought into a stillness through the breath of Shavasana, or even in Padma Asana, where they are in stiti, where they are in a stability, where they are not only at the threshold of bliss, but perhaps even experiencing through a regulated breath, through a regulated release, experiencing that threshold place of bliss. And then as a yoga teacher, you can remind your students of this purpose to samskara, this purpose of building the habit of a daily yoga practice, of a weekly visit to a yoga class that will bring a sense of auspiciousness, that there's a replacement project underway, like the great sage Milarepa, who was required on six occasions to tear down the house. And for those of you who do not know the story of this remarkable yogi, he lived a thousand years ago, and he had amassed a terrible trove of negative samskaras. And when he prostrated himself in front of his guru, his guru said, you must work. And gave him specific instructions about how to quarry stone, how to dig stone out of the ground, how to make a house of many stories and six times. The Guru Marpa told Milarepa, tear down that house and build it anew. And then finally, the seventh time, that house endures. And encourage 
your yoga students to rebuild the house of the body, the temple of the body, through every yoga class, through every meditation session, and aim toward that highest, to aim toward that place of purushakyati, where they truly can, at least for an instant, see themselves as the witness and allow that realm of the ever-changing gunas to be what it is in knowledge that this relationship is the stuff of life and through the practice of yoga, they too can discover the mastery of calm and stability. Thanks for listening to this episode of Professor Chapel's lecture series about the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Discover more episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on podcast.glo.com. I'm Derek Mills.